Okay. Right. What have we got? Good stories. Assassin's Creed 2. Assassin's Creed 2, why? Good story, revenge. Something. Revenge is always a good motivator, yeah. I feel. That's why I work in this job. <laughs> um, <laughs> depth. Depth, charismatic character, interesting big cast of characters. Okay. Uh, the missions all play into character motivations and story and all that. Okay, well, that sound, sounds fine to me. Um, I haven't played it. No, no, I can't. Never played any of the Assassin's Creed uh, games for some unbeknownst reasons. Just one of those things that's passed by. Yeah, um, sounds right up my street to be fair. Um, any more? Undertale. Undertale. Explain why. I think the story is really good because number one, you can like kind of change it up because you can do two different routes. Like games like that, where you could like roll the skate, you can do the same thing, you can do a different route if you want. Um, but I just think Undertale's a really good story, and I just think it's a very, very good game. And if I play, I get very immersed in what's going to happen next in the story. In the story itself, yeah. as well as the action. Yeah. What we have here is the difference between two types of game then. So um, mm -hmm. Assassin's Creed and games like it will have a main storyline which is linear in format. Here we have a branching. Um, you know, a structure of a story itself where at certain points in the game, the game can take different narratives depending on the player action. So in that context, oh, that's still not a fully open storyline mm -hmm. because the storyline is still dictated to an extent by how the game has been written, but you do have options as to how the story unfolds. Yeah. In fact, many popular games actually do really depend on the linear storyline, but then allow you some freedom outside of that linear storyline to develop other kind of story techniques yourself, but so also a popular way to branch. Like games like Infamous, so it's like with an evil good or bad, a good meter or bad meter, it's a very simple. Yeah, and in, in a mechanism like that allows you to develop an internal storyline. The game. And that's actually an important thing which I'll touch upon in the lecture as well, that idea of being able to develop internal depth to the storyline through a mechanism like um, a morality meter, for example. It gives you uh, the ability to build a backstory to the character, which is you know, beyond what is given to you in the story. Other games? It takes two. It takes two. Why? Uh, I really like the fact that you have to cooperate, so you have to play with another person, and it's very like intuitive. So you, you they don't really give you many like suggestions on what to do. You gotta kind of figure it out, and so you gotta kind of come up with a strategy. And I, re I really like it. It really gets me in a state of flow. The only thing is that you can't skip the story. You have to watch it, and it's like sometimes it drives me nuts because I'm like I just wanna. Does anyone do this and skip through the story? All of it, yeah. Like you know, the, especially when stories are presented in cutaway. Does anyone just rip through and doesn't care about the story? I gotta be honest, that is something I do a lot. Mm -hmm. I, in particular, this is this is a hangover, in many ways for me. I know why I do this. When I was what twenty, I put an inordinate amount of time into a game called Metal Gear Solid. Metal Gear Solid, the original one, is notorious for the vast amounts of cutaway scenes in it, including the ending, which is about 40 minutes long, which you can't skip, which you literally do nothing in. You sit and watch for 40 minutes. It's like a very long, crap television show. Because of that, that has indoctrinated me to, like, if I, as soon as that little button comes up in the corner that says press X to skip, I do hit. And then I miss a huge... I mean, I have no idea why Arthur Morgan is like he is, to be quite honest, but fuck, I'm not watching that shit. I'm moving on to the next bit. <laughs> you know, um, maybe not in that one, but uh, it's certainly a lot of games. I've played through a lot of games, and it's like... I'd sit afterwards and think, I'm not really sure why all that happened, but it was okay. <laughs> and then I could, If I want to find out the story, I can go and watch it on YouTube. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, if I really want to fill in those details, but yeah. Um, exposure to early cutaway games really did. Think. And this is another interesting from the game in, from gaming history. Back in the mid nineties, a lot of game uh, game development companies toyed with something called full motion video games, 
where they have this really bad live action games going on where you you were trapped in the story you couldn't escape or anything like that so you watch this horrendous acting because obviously video game developers weren't film studios so they couldn't hire good actors so they literally had like sub porno actors involved like people who could not act at all and you had to sit through all this shit and then you look, and then you press like C for the next bit and that was the game and then that really puts you off having to be exposed to a story in many ways right so our experience with stories can be different any other examples of good stories last loss why I was hoping somebody would say this. That's, I'm thinking just because it's, it's had its own TV series now that's been really successful. It you watched quite it? A lot of, I've watched it. The second one's just been announced as well. Yeah, which I assume is based on Last of Us 2, right? Yeah. Which, which over weird, the uh, weekend, they have decided to already begin the cash in on. Yeah. Uh, if anyone saw this, but Last of Us 2 Remastered is coming out in January. Two games and like. Full re remaster. The remaster. Re well, but yeah, but the thing about the remastering the game that came out in twenty twenty. No, it's ridiculous. It's, you can't do that. Remasters. It's got to be. A, can we have a moratorium on this? There's got to be at least a decade yeah. for a remaster. You cannot like say right a game which is perfectly playable on the new generation of consoles. Nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. You can't just say oh we're going to make a PS five version of it now. So what, what are you going to screw you and your PS. Screw you and your 70 quid. I don't know how I've I'm almost guaranteed to buy it. Um, the Last of Us has got a good story. The Last of Us has been adapted for a television show. So we have a show of hands. Has anyone played The Last of Us? There's a few. Okay, has anyone watched the TV, uh, TV series? Wonderful. I love the interest in games and games culture. It's, it's really encouraging. Is it a good TV series? Yeah. 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 Like, I thought it was okay. That's it. Takes, yeah. takes a different approach to the to the, the game as well, which is good. Because obviously, yeah, as an adapter. Did you feel it was still worth watching after having played the game? Not really. No, not me. That was the problem I, th I felt. That I didn't really get anything sufficiently different to put 10 hours of effort into watching the program when I'd already put 30 odd hours into the game a decade ago. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't really, didn't pay off for me in that way. But I think if you haven't played the game, it's well worth watching, I expect. You know, it's, yeah. Adaptation's yeah. always going to be a downgrade. I imagine. Mm -hmm. the, the direct adaptations, at least, are always going to be some kind of downgrade. I think video game adaptations are really problematic. Um, I, I would struggle to think of any adaptation of a video game which is super the only one I can think of off the top of my head is the uh, League of Legends TV series Arcane. I refuse to believe that that TV series is good. It's you need, good. You need to watch it. <laughs> watch it and no. we will prove you wrong. You're, you're misusing the word need here. Okay, you don't um, need. <laughs> I do not need to watch that program. The thing with that adaption, it takes nothing from the game. Really That's what I was thinking. Stories. It, it I, I, I would think it, 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 it's, a, it's an incredibly loose setting, adaption, right? But like, yeah, it is fairly, it is fairly um, reinvented in the material. Well, we will see. Well, they're gonna, there's loads of video game adaptions in the works. Like, uh, there's a Mass Effect one by Amazon. I don't know how they're even going to start to adapt that. Especially a game where there's a choice. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 again, I, I'm not sure about that one. Adaptation is a really interesting phenomenon with video games. It starts in the early 90s. We have a few canonical texts of adaptation. If as, have people seen the Mario movie from uh, this? Is, is it this year or last year? I forget. Uh, this, year, this, year, this, year. this year, right? But everyone seen it? It's all right. There's nothing wrong with it. Like you know, it's, uh, I'm a bit old for it, but there you are. I I, I wasn't bored shitless. I I I recommend everyone watches the 1993. Super Mario Brothers movie. Has anyone actually seen this? That was like the normal people, it? like real people. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've seen it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Give me a one sentence review. 
I don't know what that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> you were right to go down the route, by the way. You stopped yourself. I don't know what the fuck it's about. You were right to say that. <laughs> because I couldn't tell you. It's, it has nothing to do with the game whatsoever. Nothing at all. Very literally nothing. It's, it's dark. Yeah. And quite disturbing, there are a number of um, references to interspecies relationships in it, which are quite disturbing. Um, there are no gold coins yeah. at all. I mean, it can't be a Mario game. It doesn't bounce on any turtles. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's... Whatever they were smoking yeah. was pretty potent. Um, I, I kind of... I recommend... It's on Amazon Prime, if you've got it. And... I recommend you try to watch it. You won't get very far. If you get to half an hour, give yourself a break and turn it off, right? Because if you can get that far in it, you've done your penance for the day, right? But it's not good in any way, shape, or form. Um, what other games did they adapt in the 90s? Uh, the, I, I, this used to be on streaming, the Street Fighter game, but I haven't seen it on streaming for a very long time. If you want to see how how not to act, that that film is wonderful. If you want to see why Kylie Minogue is a singer and not an actress, watch that film. It's spectacularly bad. And there was a Mortal Kombat game, which made a uh, movie which made absolutely no sense and had no kind of story attached to it whatsoever. Well, the game that doesn't that have that any story. Though. The game doesn't have any story as well. And the worst bit of that film was. There was no ripping of people's spines out or anything like that. It was, it was the point of that's the only reason you play Mortal Kombat is to watch the hideously gruesome sort of ending. So yeah, that was a complete waste of everyone's time. So there's been a few over the years, right? You've had um, Resident Evil has been adapted into a series of films which are all terrible. Um, we've had a few Assassin's Creed is that movie, right? Oh, yeah, uh, which really was, about them. yeah, which was <laughs> dreadful. Um, Warcraft. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a film that was absolutely dreadful. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's a theme underpinning all of these mm -hmm. adaptations, and it's quite simple to get a grasp of, right? Yeah. Adapting from a video game to um, a linear narrative like a film is a really, really bad idea because games aren't films. Anytime you adapt to a static medium like television or film, what you are doing is taking away the one element that makes the game unique, which is, like I said in previous lectures, we play the game, we don't sit and watch the game. We go from being an active participant in the text to being a passive participant in watching the text. So you take away, basically, the enjoyable thing about it, which is why I would kind of don't want to ever watch that series. I've watched you bits of it. Not only do I know what, what's going to happen in it because I've played the game, also, I'm going to itch doing it because I want to be pressing the buttons and making the characters do those things instead of them doing it in front of me and I've got no agency whatsoever. It, it would annoy me intensely to do that. Things like Sonic and Mario films are a little different because like those Sonic movies are, really don't have a great deal to do with the games. They're more fr brand fan fantasies. Exactly, they are. yeah, and I, I think that stands for the Super Mario movie as well. And I'm sure that's that's going to run into like four, five sequels fairly quickly as well. But something like Last of Us, which tries to recreate it, Assassin's Creed is a, is a good example of this. It's like the film is like. My only takeaway, I, I didn't actually finish the film because it was fairly dreadful, but I, I looked at it and thought, well, why am I sitting here watching this when I could just go, I could go down to CX, buy the game for a tenner? Yeah, I have a better experience, you know? Yeah. It doesn't help that the films are not good. Usually, no. they, obviously, they sell, they, they get these IPs and they think, all right, we're going to get this out for the cheapest possible yeah. way for the writers. And I mean, it's been muted over the years. A lot of games have been muted for adaptation over the years. In particular, the Rockstar games have been muted. And that would be a really bad idea. Yeah. I think they got quite far with doing Bully as a TV show. Um, as a series, it would have been a series of like 12, I think, or something like that. And I, I want to say it was Amazon that was developing it, but they gave up on it. I think they gave up on it and decided to do The Boys instead. Now that's a good TV series. That's that's entertaining. You know, that's that's a proper one. I don't think Bully would have been any fun to watch. It is fun to play. 
despite the amorality of going around beating the shit out of little kids in a and let's be fair, we all did it when we were in school. But, you know, it, it is an amoral action, um, but it is fun to do things which are amoral. To watch them puts us in a slightly different, complicit sort of situation, I think. So, what we're going to talk about today is, um, and as, like I said to everyone who was here earlier, this is going to finish quite early today because I'm going to do a little step by step through the assignment because I know. It approaches very fast, so I'm going to go through that. So this is a much shorter lecture than we would usually have. Narratology and the stories of games from a ping pong ball to Arthur Morgan. So for those of you who don't know, Arthur Morgan is Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption 2 main character. The only one of two playable characters in the game, right? Because there's the epilogue as well. Um, and the ping pong ball refers to Pong. pong. Yeah. First, I would say, really popular video game. Okay? You might think, well, there's no story to Pong. Wrong. Very, very wrong. People would play Pong <laughs> and invent stories. Okay, so you, 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 can you, you all know what I'm referring to with Pong, right? You've got the idea of you've got a flipper here, a flipper there, the dotted line in the middle of the ball, right? How do you invent the story? If you miss, your opponent dies. Yeah, because your opponent, who is simply, you know, a, a we, I don't think it's even fair to call that AI, given the memory the constraints of Pong. You know, the, the game Pong has the same memory as a digital watch. If, the, if you want a comparison of how little memory goes into a game like that, a digital watch is more sophisticated in many ways than Pong. People would invent stories, like, you know, I'm up against the world ping pong champion here on the other side, and it is me. Me, I am that one, and the world ping pong champion is that one, and I'm going to beat said world ping pong champion. This is a drive that we have to inject the storyline that gives meaning to most experiences, right? I do it in um, Cost Cutter all the time. If there's a long queue in Cost Cutter, right, and I'm trying to get my, my grapes and fucking coke, um, I invent stories about the people in front of me in the queue. It's like this one has done seven years for, you know, abusing sheep. This one is, you know, clearly. Um, goes home and you know masturbates to children's programming, you know, etc. etc. Because they are in my way, right, and they're stopping me from achieving my goals, you know. So I have to invent ways to feel more resentment about them at that point. We do this, we don't do it like me, I hope, but we create narratives and storylines about our world all the time to help us do a very simple thing. We create narratives and stories about the world to help us make sense of the events that happen in the world. When things are, it's almost a little bit of McLuhanism here, but when we don't have much information about the world itself, we will inject information into scenarios in order to make them more palatable or in order to make them more understandable to us. We do this with video games too. So the history of video games before character became a major element of games was, or, and certainly before narrative became a major element of games in the 1990s, people would build narratives of their own in order to improve the experience of playing games themselves. Therefore, narrative is actually a really important part of the experience of games. But if, if you look at the history of games themselves, you can see there's a lot of games that have no narrative element, basically. But that doesn't mean we don't add narrative elements to it. We an example from FIFA, right? You pick a player, you know, and so on. Maybe FIFA's not the best example of this, but maybe there's another football game which is a great example, Championship Manager, mm -hmm. where you could pick up players who obviously the game has designed, but they don't necessarily exist, or they exist in a, in a context in the real sport, which isn't the one that they exist in the game. And you kind of invent the storyline yourself to support how this player became absolutely incredible and became a star and championship manager when actually in reality they're shit and they're playing for Woking, you know, so, yeah. Okay. So, 
Where do we start? Well, let's have a start with character. The first discernible characters in video games emerged in the early 1980s during the arcade boom. So, the first character that had any kind of impact would be Pac-Man in the 1980s. Pac-Man starts in... Pac-Man was released in 1980 and becomes the first identifiable valuable character and becomes the first video game phenomenon as a character. In the late 1970s, you have the first video games that become pop culture artifacts, if you like. In particular, Space Invaders in 1977 becomes a huge pop culture phenomenon. In 1980, Pac-Man comes along and becomes a different pop culture phenomenon because there is a discernible character in Pac-Man. And you know, he's not the greatest character we've ever seen. You know, a pizza with a slice missing. Effectively, that is the actual underlying design of the character. But something big happens with Pac-Man that's never happened before. Anyone want to hazard a guess what that is? I'm looking around the room for a discernible example of it. Yeah, okay. Pass it around when you're done. <laughs> Merchandising. We've got a specific term for merchandising in media um, when we talk about media texts that have merchandise which emerges amongst uh, wider culture. Does anyone know what that is? It's a word I've probably used previously in lectures. Paratext. Write it down. Pac-Man becomes the first character that has significant paratextual elements. In that, Pac-Man becomes a character which you can buy soft toys of, you can buy a wall clock of, you can buy a light of, you can buy the pencil case, you can buy the backpack, you can buy the t-shirt, you can buy the watch, right? All these sort of things, right? So Pac-Man becomes a discernible character with a, para, um, a character by which we can have paratextual relationships with. Not only having a relationship in the game, but having a discernible relationship outside of the game. That becomes incredibly important because from there you have the development of story for Pac-Man. In order to market Pac-Man as a paratextual element, you have to develop the story. The game itself has no story. It is simply Pac-Man is in a maze, has to eat all the little pebbles, and so on and so forth. Did you play it on uh, no, Wednesday? No, I didn't get a chance. Okay. We have a Pac-Man arcade machine. We built it, right? Well, kind mostly of. Built. I, I, I mostly <laughs> built it, but I needed help, to be fair. Um, you should see all the shelves in my house. They're fucking hacking off the floor, <laughs> so I didn't need help. Um, so, we, if anyone wants to play the original, I have, we have the arcade machine now down in the room, which is really up and working. But, first identifiable viable character. Now, the first cutscenes emerge in 1981 with Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong! Has anyone ever played Donkey Kong? Yeah? What do you have to do? Well, you have to uh, rescue the princess of Paula. I love the princess, actually, from the Donkey Kong. You have to jump over barrels. Yeah, which are thrown by a giant gorilla. Uh, called uh, Donkey Kong, uh, and the character you are playing is Mario. Is Mario, and I don't. In the first Donkey Kong game, the character wasn't named. Yeah. So, so if you like, that character became Mario. There is a story to it. Now, the rescue of the princess when you get to the top of this kind of platform-based um, snakes and ladders sort of thing that's going on. <coughs> when you rescue the, uh, was she a princess? I mean, she became the princess, but yeah. Um, the, that story is told in cutaways. Yeah. So once you achieve the end of the level, you get a cutaway scene, and then you go on to the next level, because you know, so on. So you actually start to see the development of a narrative here, albeit it's a fairly thin narrative. You know, This gigantic rip-off of King Kong is pinching your girlfriend every five minutes, basically, and then throwing barrels at you. It's not war and peace, but it's a start. Um, the damsel in distress narrative is, without doubt, the most popular narrative in the video game genre. 
uh, in the video game. In video game media, the idea of um, the whole purpose of the story of a game is to rescue a woman who has got in trouble is on the certainly like the most popular one. Why, why, why might I raise this as an issue? What's wrong with this picture? Traditionally, and it's something that we've touched upon before, the development of narrative in games positioned female characters as having zero agency in games at all. All agency is the domain of male characters. Female characters are simply there to drive the narrative forward by very often doing stupid things, um, which is not great. Indeed, my favorite video game of all time, uh, Ghouls and Ghosts for the Sega Mega Drive, Again, Loki, the demon Loki comes up from hell, steals Arthur's girlfriend, and then you have to go through six levels to defeat, well, actually go through five levels, then you have to start all over again, go through six levels in one of the hardest video games ever made, and then you rescue the princess at the end. And guess what happens in the next version? She gets kidnapped again by Loki, and then so on and so forth. Right? Very, very popular um, storyline, but very, very... Um, problematic. At the start then of video games we have things like Space War and Pong, no discernible story but you do get elements right from the beginning that people will invent narratives in order to make this emaciated game environment more interesting to them. If you're playing Space War, you know, I'm on this spaceship, you know, I, I'm, I'm traveling to, I'm, I'm a Star Trek nerd, right, I'm, I'm traveling through deep space on this spaceship and Oh my God, here come these dots, which are other spaceships who are coming to kill me and I'm going to do something about it. Today, we have rich stories and fully realized environments. But the question you always have to ask yourself is this, is this down to the narrative itself? Narrative, this is the root of one of the biggest debates in game studies in total. And there are people that I work with in this university that have a wrong opinion on this, and I have the right opinion on this. There are people in this university who will say, the reason why games are so immersive and rich today is because of the narrative that they provide for players. What I will say to them is, no, you are wrong, and you are very, very wrong, and you are so wrong you need to leave my presence right now because it's actually the narrative is a function of the game itself. Narrative doesn't sit outside of the fact that we play. And it, you can have the most involving storyline that you can ever want from a video game, but if the game plays like a piece of shit, it doesn't matter, and you're not going to care about the storyline, because you're never going to play through it, because the game is not interesting to play. The storyline and the game are interlinked with one another, you don't care about the story if the game isn't a pleasurable experience. So the ludology, as we call it, how the game is played, is as important, if not more important, than the narrative elements of the game. And ludology has always been the key to it. If I go back to those early games, if they were terrible to play, nobody would have invented those stories about like what the purpose of the game is. Nobody would have cared. If Pac-Man was an awful game to play, nobody would have cared about it. Pac-Man's backstory, which is a genuine thing, which has been written, which there are canonical and non-canonical versions of. Unbelievably. Um, but nobody would care if the game was a piece of shit. And there are millions of games which are now largely forgotten and have probably disappeared into the mists of times because historically video games have not been very well archived. You know, so there are historic games from the early generations of video games which have disappeared. There's no way of playing them anymore, no one has the source code, they're gone. Those games may not have had interesting stories, but the key to them was that they weren't any fun to play in the first place, and that's why they've been forgotten. You know, games that were fun to play stay, stick around, basically. You know, Space Invaders, when I say Space Invaders, you all know what I'm talking about. Because it's, it's a fun game to play, you know? It's not very involving, but it's, it's all right for 10 minutes. It's a blast. Pac-Man's, you know, it's fun, you know? 
getting chased around, you eat one of those big pills, all of a sudden the ghosts turn the other colour. You heard me the other day mm -hmm. when I was playing. First time I played that game in years, and it was like, as soon as I entered, it was like, yeah, now the tables have turned, motherfucker. Yeah, I'm coming after you, Clyde. I even know the names of the ghosts. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, the game is fun. Key thing, as always, games are played, not watched. This is why games which are heavy on narrative don't tend to be actually that popular at all. So I'm, with some notable exceptions, I did say Metal Gear Solid earlier, and that's a series of games which messes with this a little bit, but it's still actually a really good game to play. And that's a very important point about the Metal Gear Solid series. It actually invented an entirely new way of playing games anyway, the stealth mode playing didn't really exist before Metal Gear Solid. In that, you know, it's still actually a really interesting and kind of fun game to get involved with, but it has heavy story elements to it. We can question in this day and age this notion, though, that games are played, not watched. You know, the emergence of Twitch as a platform does draw significant questions about, actually, do we get a lot of pleasure from watching games as well? I don't know if this is a generational thing. I still don't get much out of watching somebody play a game on Twitch. But I, but I can't argue with the figures and you know the streaming numbers. It's clear that a hell of a lot of people out there enjoy watching people play video games and don't play them themselves. So I can't argue with that. But in terms of narrative in games, we play, we don't watch. And the narrative unfolds in front of us rather than it's something which we inject ourselves. What we're talking about here is story spot, right? So, there are reasons why narrative and gameplay is often confused in games, and that's why I made that, that they're interlinked intimately. With a heads up here, a lot of you will have the opportunity to talk about the narrative of the game you are playing in the video you are making. I'm looking at you in specifically, Connor, because I would expect you to talk a little bit about the story. If, for, if it's for a game like you know, the one you're doing, I would, I would kind of think that you wouldn't do that. Okay? Doing something like FIFA, I think that would be incredibly difficult to do, because what's the story of FIFA? I don't really think there is one, you know? but. But you may have invented one in your head, for example. Um, but it's easy to confuse these two elements, I think. Gameplay and narrative. Now, the reason why it's easy to confuse is because they are, in a well-made game, gameplay and narrative are fused together. They are interlinked intimately. They don't sit apart from one another. What you are asked to do in the game powers the narrative. And the narrative contextualizes what you are asked to do. So they're always working in parallel with one another. In a very well designed game, that is. You can always tell if a game isn't particularly well designed if the one sits apart from the other and they don't really link with one another. You know, if there's a story going on here which has nothing to do. And I think, are they getting, yeah, there's a hell of a lot of games like this. Yeah, I am. Um, Watchdog series. We, you know what I'm talking about? Watchdog. Has anyone played Watchdog Legion, mm -hmm. the one set in London? Oh yes, shit. With a caveat, it is, but it's shit for a very specific reason. There's a really interesting story. And I, I do mean a really interesting story, but it's about like a, a near future London. There's some really interesting parts of the game, and the rendering of London is incredibly interesting. The rendering of London is really accurate. It's like you, you're walking around, and it's like, I've walked here. You know, you, you know, you can actually picture yourself doing the walking. Like. And this game has a really interesting sort of neo-fascist storyline, where you know, Britain's been taken over by a fascist government, and the purpose of the game here is to utilise flaws in the massive surveillance system that the government utilises to control people in order to break the government itself. So there's a, there's a story to be told a million times, but it's interesting enough. The reason why the game is shit is because you play the first mission, 
and then you will play the next the first mission and then you'll play it again and then you'll play that first mission about 75 times in order to complete the game there is no variation in the gameplay whatsoever so after about an hour you're bored senseless with what you have to do because you literally do the same thing over like and hack, over that. That. hack that hack that hack that make that camera go off blow up those two things there mission completed move on to the next area do exactly the same thing over and over again you think why am i doing this so this is really really dull here we have the bigger purpose of that is, it's never really explained why the things that you do to do that mm. further the purpose of the game in any way, <laughs> shape or form. It, it, does, it just doesn't do that. So the game and the narrative are not linked. You want, In this case, you're kind of an interesting story, which could be the basis of a really interesting game, but the gameplay has been so poorly thought out. You know, it's, it, I, it's a laugh to do it the first time, and the second time, you're like, oh, okay, all right, all right, third time, you're like, I've just done this, and you want me to do it 70 more times? Mm. You know, it, it's, it's really dull. These things are always linked together in very intimate ways, and when the, one of the elements breaks down, that means you stop caring about the story as well. You really don't care, you know, you're like, oh, I don't care if Britain's turned into a fascist country, to be honest, this is really dull, you know, give me something better to do. Now, Jesper Yule, who's somebody we've encountered in this module, the player can tell a story of a game session. Does anyone do this? Play a game for a while and you tell the story of what happened in your head. Yeah, that's something I do. Something I do fairly often. Many games, of course, contain narrative elements, and video games and narrative share some structural issues, but games and games are not stories. So. Because of these reasons, because there are some structural similarities between games and stories, we do confuse them in that way. What we should not do is confuse them, we should say game and narrative is the same thing. We've got to recognise that they are different to one another, and in, in the best instances of games, they are co-constructive elements. So the game and the narrative work together to create the experience. If we have a positive experience playing a game, a particular type of game, then it's game and narrative that work hand in hand one, in one, one another to create that experience itself. They don't, in successful games, exist independently of one another and they're not confused with one another either. They are separate but related. That's the, if you like, that's what game designers are always going to aim for. Game is always an interactive experience. If you are playing, I can't think of how you can play a game in a non-interactive way. You are always interacting with the game in some way. Now what Janet Murray argues is that interaction and narrative are therefore separate planes of the same experience. So at a base level, we're always interacting with the text. The narrative sits at a different level of understanding of the same text. It's like we have two ways we can interpret it. We have a game way of interpreting, we have a narrative way of interpreting. And because of that, what Murray calls games is what we call symbolic dramas. The drama element is the story playing out, but the symbolic element is the fact that we are always interacting with the game in particular ways. We are a symbolic actor within that unfolding story. Whether the story comes from us or comes from the, is provided by the game itself. This idea of separate planes is an interesting one because when we play particular games, I think we can think of it in terms, if you sort of, I'm going to use, I just said I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm going to use Red Dead Connection because it's an interesting example. If, when you play in the game, I mean, literally, when you're in the middle of a shootout or something, and you're doing a mission, the story element becomes secondary in that moment when you're actually acting in the game. If you like, it, it, at one level, before you start that set piece, the narrative play is important. And then you move into the playing space, and then you move back out into the narrative space. So what Murray is talking, I don't think Janet Murray's wrong in any way, but I think she's talking about a certain type of game design here, where that narrative and the game <coughs> kind of swap over in terms of attention as you progress through it. 
That's a really, really common way of playing games, especially any gameplay uh, where the narrative is powered by cutaways. That's nearly always how they work. So you have moments where the gameplay is the important thing, and then other moments where you're taken out that to, in order for the story to progress. They are linked with one another, and you know what you do powers that other thing, but they swap in terms of attention. Now, if you think of, I've used the Outer Worlds here, so we skip to the Outer Wilds. Do you, from what I understand, that's not a very cutaway heavy. Not at all. Exactly. Not at all. So this is where. Do you want to uh, explain a little bit how, if anything, story works in it for me, Kyriakos? Story mostly driven just for your own context. So other than the ending, yeah, there's a few cutscenes. Uh, basically, the story is you discovering what's going on and how to fix the situation by exploration. Minor spoilers. Uh, basically, the 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 universe that the solar system keeps supernova in, so the sun keeps exploding. Right, but it resets the time, and you've got 20 minutes in game to, to change, uh, find stuff out. The more you find stuff out, it adds to your log, and then the game becomes more about how you can quickly find out information. And once you find out how the repeat ending is a risk against time, it's did, it come, did it come out before Deadloop? Uh, yeah. yeah, it did. Okay, so Deadloop stole this from that game. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> because it's because it's incredibly simple yeah. um, in how that's done. So. In that version, now that kind of game, I don't think Murray's distinction between those two elements, the, the, the idea of separate planes works. So what I'd say is that Janet Murray's explanation here of how interactivity is an important part of the link between narrative and gameplay works for some games, but it won't work for all. For, and the other one that I was thinking of as an example for this, but I was pretty sure the Outer Wilds fit into this, but it was Deadloop. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with Deadloop, but it's one of these endlessly repetitive sort of game scenarios. You play an assassin, yeah. and you have to kill another assassin, but you don't know why. And as you play the game further and further, and you progress, you understand what the story is as you play it, basically. Yeah. The story unfolds for you in a sort of a real-time environment, but you're actually chasing the story rather than... You're playing the game in order to understand what the story is, basically. And then once you kind of unlock the story, you get to the point where you can kill the other assassin then. You know? So it's, in that sense, I don't think interactivity and narrative exist on separate planes to one another because they're actually one and the same thing in this case. So whereas I think Murray's right about this, I think she's right about it in, when we talk about a certain class of game rather than all games. But that notion of the symbolic drama, I think, is a particularly useful little shorthand to do. One thing we should always think about in terms of narrative is the idea of space. Game space and narrative, and the powerful uh, factor engaging players and giving them the sense that they're inhabiting a place rather than perceiving a representation of space, is the idea of story. When designers create if like, the game space themselves, we will need some kind of story to explain to us what that space is, why we are in it. Even for something, I think, like the Outer Wilds, that mechanism of the supernova mm -hmm. provides a story context for why the space is as it is yeah. and what we need to do with it. Right? So because of that, how designers go about creating game spaces is a foundational aspect of what the narrative of the story is going to be, effectively. Where does this take place? When does it take place? How does it take place? What are the elements of the space that we are in? Will all provide narrative elements for us. And one of the key things that games can do which other stories can't do. If you think of films, even to a certain extent, I think, well, more than a certain extent, a very large extent, novels. It is the role of the author or writer or director to tell you why that world is like it is. But instead, with video games, what we can do is explore that space and the narrative will unfold from that exploration, which can be a mechanism of the gameplay itself. So the more we explore it, the more we understand what that space is. It's a classic example of uh, how Rockstar developed their game spaces. 
they allow a sense of vast movement in it because you can un you get more depth to the actual space that you're in from more interactions you have, the more side missions you do, etc. You understand that space better. That then gives you more depth of experience in the world itself. In particular, that goes for how they've developed their online spaces. I think even more than the games, the actual game text themselves. So one of the underrated things with video games is how space creates narrative, basically. And you, you know, I think then therefore that Outer Wilds example is really interesting because. At one level, you can look at the space and think, what am I supposed to do here? But that's not how it works. Yeah, after Worlds, it's literally, the space defines the narrative. Yes. In a way. You're, the way you learn about the story is for exploring the space. And it's, it's far from the first game that has taken this approach. Actually going out and exploring, I mean, I tell you far from the first game, because I think the first game that does define this approach is the Oregon Trail which is a game which is uh, created in uh, 40 years ago, actually, 1983, where you are given a really emaciated sort of visual space. You make your way through the game space, and you are given the story as it goes through. And what the classic line from it is, oh no, you have all died of dysentery. You've done it, you've gone through it wrong if you've done it that way, but yeah, don't, don't die of dysentery. Okay, that's going to be a really bad way to go. Um, this is a very rare way of doing things, to be fair. I think, obviously, The Outer Wild sounds like one. The classic games that do this in their most bleak and awful form is Dark Souls. Do we have any Dark Souls players? Yeah. It's good Dark Souls, isn't it? Yeah. It's good for getting frustrated. <laughs> it's good for getting deep. Dark Souls, um, I love the Dark Souls games because they're a throwback. They're a throwback to my youth where video game playing was often characterised by instant and rapid death over and over and over again until you learned how to do something to the pixel perfect degree and you couldn't get past something until you did that. So you would die and die and die about a thousand times. You would curse everyone. You would go down for your tea and your mother would give you a plate of chips and beans or whatever and you'd throw it against the fucking wall because you would be so frustrated by what was happening in this video game. Then you don't go out for two weeks, and then it becomes a whole thing, and you end up listening to um, you know Nine Inch Nails and becoming a goth. That's basically how it. You know, that's the 1990s in a nutshell. Right? Now, Dark Souls is a wonderful example of this because you don't know what the fuck is going on. You have to explore the world in order to understand what the hell is going on, and then you get killed over and over and over again until you work out what's going on. It's I think it's a bit of a cheat, because I actually don't think there's that much going on in those games, but it, but it is a kind of a cheat mechanism to get you exploring. By and large, most of the plot in FromSoft's like Dark Souls, Elden Ring, Bloodborne, most of the plot has already happened, mm. and you are kind of just, your, your role in the narrative is largely to pick up the pieces in the aftermath of it. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's kind of a cheat, but you don't know that until no. you've actually done that bit of work to get there. So... Again, as a heads up for what you're going to be submitting, you might want to think about the game space itself and how that influences how you understand what's going on in the game and how, you influ and how that influences your understanding of the story of it as well. It's an incredibly important part of how we play games. But much more fundamental than that, it's a very important part of why we play certain games over and over again in the game space. And this really does deserve some attention. Once I've done this spiel, I'll break for five minutes. But if you think most people will have a game that they're quite happy to go back to, like over and over again, for years and years and years. You know, the older you are, the longer that period gets. There are games I go back to. I've got a switch in my office, right? And when I've got five, ten minutes, I'll pull the switch out and play a little bit. And I've got the Sega Classics collection on it. And the two games I go back to all the time are, three games I go back to all the time. Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Ghouls and Ghosts, and a game called Toe Jam and Earl, which was probably the first what we call roguelike um, game environment. The 
reason why I go back to Toe Jam and Earl is really, really simple. I like the world. It takes place in this very weird sort of interpretation of planet Earth, where planet Earth is structured in 25 levels that you have to go up and down in an elevator. And the purpose of the game is you find bits of Toe Jam and Earl's spaceship, and then when you've got them all on level 25, you fly off and go back home. And in the interim period, you have all these weird interactions with, like, belly dancers and irate teachers and kids who've got a monk on and throw things at you from a, you know, a pram and stuff like that. And it's a bit weird and fucked up, but it's, it's great. I love that environment. I loved that environment in 1991 when I first bought the game. And I love it 32 years on. It's a, it's a place I like to hang out in. It's a place I like to spend time in. That element of the space being somewhere where you like to be is so underestimated in video games and it is something that you might want to tap into here. Why does the space, why is it a nice space? And that feeling of the space being good is very often intricately linked to how the space tells the story of the game. Games which are really successful at keeping people over long periods of time tend to have spaces which operate in a narrative way. The space has a richness to it that it tells a story. So it's definitely something that's worth reflecting upon. Okay, let's have five minutes and then we will trash cutscenes. Why I think cutscenes are worse.